Good morning, everyone. It is Sunday, January 24th, 2021. It has been a very good week for me. Hopefully it has been for you. Uh, it has been an eventful week for our country, even as we had the inauguration of uh, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris as the next president and vice president um, of our country. And uh, if you're seeing me right now, you, and, and if you were here last week or previous weeks, you probably can tell, yes, I've gotten a haircut and everything. And uh, soon after getting that haircut, I stepped on the scale. And either because I got rid of enough hair or because I did what I asked you to do this week and, and fasted uh, uh, for the uh, breakfast and lunch, one way or the other, I lost a couple of pounds this week. And uh, so thankful uh, for that. Uh, too bad I can't shave that much hair off every day, uh, but it is what it is. And Tammy's sitting over here laughing at me as usual, and she told me ahead of time that she checked to make sure that her volume on her phone was already down so she didn't have a repeat of last week where her phone was doing an echo of everything that I that I was saying here this morning. So hopefully everything will come through nice and, and uh, clear and strong today. We're sitting here in front of the fireplace. Hope that you're warm. Uh, from what I understand, we might be looking at some snow um, tomorrow and into Tuesday, uh, early Tuesday morning. So if that happens, she's hoping it happens. You know why. You betcha. Yeah, she's hoping not to have to go to school on Monday. She's still got all her work already done and everything in case, for the most part. Uh, but... Uh, be nice to be able to know tonight that she can get sleep in in the morning as well as some of the rest of you who went back to school in mineral county uh this week would have that same opportunity as well so be a a welcome thing uh for everybody at least those people that don't have to get out on the roads and such which hopefully is the majority of you got a lot of stuff we're going to cover this morning uh, we're going to th this whole morning as we gather together as we gather every Sunday morning, whether it be virtual or soon in person, we come here to worship. We come here to worship God. And one of the means that we have to be able to do that is for us singing together. Now, I'm going to lead you uh, the words to the song there on our Facebook page. Uh, if you want to pull those up and uh, take a look at those. Some of these songs you'll be very familiar with and might know them by heart. For those of you particularly that have been in church for a long time, for the majority of your life and such. But I would encourage you to join along with me. Please drown me out. Uh, as I had somebody tell me this week, uh, I am not the greatest of singers. But that's okay. Because the Lord says to give a joyful noise. And hopefully we can do that before God this morning. To give Him glory. And this morning, the song, To God Be the Glory. Here we go. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his Son, who yielded his life and atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory. Great things he hath done. Oh, perfect redemption, the purchase of blood. To every believer the promise of God, the vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. 
Great things he hath taught us, great things he hath done, and great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son, but purer and higher and greater will be our wonder, our transport, when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. God has done great things. One of them has not given me a great voice, but we can worship him because he is worthy of whatever it is that we have to offer him and whatever means we have to give it. Uh, if you do not know me, I am Pastor Chris. I am humbled and thankful to God for giving me the opportunity to be the pastor of Danville Community Baptist Church in Rawlings, Maryland. Now, obviously, we're not in a church building right now. This would be an unusual setting for a church building and such. Our church has been closed uh, for, since mid-November due to COVID uh, uh, spiking in our area. Thankfully, those numbers are coming down, uh, which is the benefit to our families and our community, but also to our church as we anticipate being able to be back in each other's physical presence once again two weeks from today february 7th our church doors will reopen uh, just for our worship service for now we'll, we'll add sunday school back in later but for now just our worship service on sunday morning and our wednesday night bible study and if you are uh, not normally a part of our church or don't have a church home we would encourage you we would invite you to come and be a part of our worship uh, being here on Facebook is giving you an idea of what we're like, and this is who we are. It's just, you know, nothing different about who we are here on Facebook. It's just it's a different setting, and we have a piano <laughs> and better singers than me to be able to do the music with, uh, but the advantage is you get to be around people, <laughs> people that we love, um, people that we value very, very highly. And so we look forward to that. February 7th, two weeks from today, 1045, the worship service begins. So we encourage you, each of you, church family and those that are guests, and just want to check it out, be with us on that Sunday morning. Several other announcements I want to mention to you. And even with our virtual environment, I'm so thankful uh, for our church family and their faithfulness in their tithes and offerings. And I make this announcement only to our church family because it, I'm not asking anybody else to uh, contribute to our ministry. God is gracious and generous to us. Be faithful to your church, though, in your tithes and offerings. And for our church family, you can mail your tithes and offerings to 18,800 Middle Ridge Road in Rawlings, Maryland. Soon you'll be able to give those in person, but I thank you for your faithfulness and giving those throughout um, our second time of separation. I'd ask you to do something as well for me. It's much easier, much less costly. Hit that share button. Share this with other people. Uh, the more people you share this with, uh, the more people will hear it. And I mm, got a message for you today. And uh, somebody out there, maybe it's you, maybe it's somebody that you will share it with, maybe it's just a stranger. Somebody needs to hear this message this morning. It touched my heart. And I know that it will touch other people's as well. Uh, give us a comment. Let us know that you're there. It's encouraging to me when I uh, see uh, the people that were with us here on Facebook. I'm not able to see uh, who all is here with us. So that's your way of being able to indicate to me, hey, I'm, I'm with you, Pastor Chris. Soon I'll be able to see your face. And know that we'll still have our Facebook uh, going even when we are uh in actual physical presence with each other. So some of you that may not feel like coming back yet because of uh, COVID concerns, understood, support you in that. Others that uh, live in other states, uh, Georgia, Ohio, uh, Pennsylvania. I saw this week that some of our posts have gone to Santiago, Chile. <laughs> Go figure. Uh, but you know how that happens? It's when you share it. That's primarily how that happens. So please share this message with other people. 
We will continue to have our 5 o'clock Bible studies this week, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, and Thursday night. Where as usual, we'll take what we're dealing with this morning and we will expand on a little bit. The subject we're going to deal with today is way too big to be able to deal with in the short time frame we've got this morning. So we're going to expand on that a little bit through the week, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. So I encourage you to be with us. Well, that's it on announcements this morning. Let's take some time to worship once again in song. If you're looking at that, uh, those songs that we're using this morning, you see three choruses right in a row, and we're going to take those right in a row together. They, Though they're different songs written by different people at different times, they fit very, very well together as we worship our Almighty God. Here we go. I worship you, oh my God. There is none like you. I worship you, O Prince of Peace. That is what I long to do. I give you praise, for you are my righteousness. I worship you, Almighty God. There is none like you, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There's just something about that name, Master, Savior, Jesus. Like the fragrance after the rain. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Let all heaven and earth proclaim. Kings and kingdoms will all pass away but there's something about that name i have a maker he formed my heart before even time began my life was in his hands he knows my name he knows my every thought he sees each tear that falls and hears me when i call I have a father, he calls me his own, he'll never leave me, no matter where I go, he knows my name. He knows my every thought. He sees each tear that falls and hears me when I call. He knows my name. He knows my every thought. He sees each tear that falls and hears me when I call. I don't know if you could hear from that other member of our family, our dog, that my singing is not the greatest in the world. She's howling over there, probably not because of my singing, it's probably because she wants to go out again. But <laughs> just another evidence that we need some other singers. Uh, to come and uh, worship together and lead in our music time. So looking forward to that. And if you don't have a church home and you want to be a part of our church, uh, regardless of whether this is true or not, you can be a part. But if you have a better singing voice than me, 
You would be very welcome. So come along. And in fact, it is one of our prayers to add some more to our, our musical repertoire in our church. But uh, we've got some other prayer requests we want to share with you this morning. If you've got some prayer needs, go ahead and put those in the comment section or you can send them to me via Messenger. Or if you've got something near and dear to your heart that you don't want in a public environment like Facebook, just put down prayers, please, and know that someone will be praying with you. And I will be eventually as I go back and see those comments um, later on. But specifically, I may mention a few things to you. Mentioned last week that Mike Nicolosi was going to be having a surgery on his hand this week. That surgery went well. And he goes back to the surgeon this week just to be able to get the bandages off and, and check to make sure that everything uh, went well, achieved the purpose that uh, was desired there. So continue to be in prayer for him. Then Linda Lease mentioned uh, a baby by the name of Kenley this week who is having some breathing problems. And they're trying to diagnose exactly what's going on with that. So be in prayer for baby Kenley and for the family. Speaking of breathing, obviously we need to continue to be in prayer concerning COVID. As I said, the numbers are coming down, but there are still too many people that are getting it, too many people that are dying, too many families that are being affected by this. So continue to pray, continue to practice good hygiene, continue to wear your mask, which we will be doing when we get back to church as well. And uh, so continue to do those things. Give me an update on Jason Crow. Jason Crow is home. <laughs> Hallelujah. And he wants to pass along his prayers uh, to you, his thanks for your prayers as well. Jason sent me a message this week and said the doctors did not think he was going to come home from the hospital. It was not a good situation. But uh, Jason knows that your prayers were part of the reason that, uh, that he's still here. So thank you for that. Continue to be in prayer for Bill Lease and for Clifford Weese. Uh, Clifford Weese, Nancy, I hope I get this right, is Nancy's uncle. She said that he is doing better, and so thankful for that. But continue to be in prayer for him. Be in prayer for Jeff and Josh Wagner as they are down in Florida. Uh, they're doing a job down there. Be down there for several days, so please be in prayer for them with the job as well as their traveling. Then a friend of uh, Tammy and mine down in Georgia, Cindy Edwards, been a friend for many years, used to be her Sunday school teacher, and she and her husband Mark have been going through it virtually since ever since we met them. And Cindy's dealing with uh, cancer. She was already in the hospital because of an infection, and while she was in the hospital, she was diagnosed with covid so please be in prayer uh, for Cindy Edwards. Be in prayer for Christians around the world who are dealing with persecution. Pray that they will stay firm in their faith. And then be in prayer for uh, two children that we sponsor in Uganda, Peter and Ruth. Be in prayer for them. And for our school personnel and families affected by school opening as well as school closure. Uh, uh, Mineral County is back in. Allegheny County, not yet. Uh, so pray that those things will happen soon. And then be in prayer for President Biden and his administration. Remember, as we talked about last week, that we are supposed to pray for our administration, not about them. Well, we can pray about them too, but make sure you pray for them. Let's pray together. Father, we've got many needs in our heart, many situations that are going on, some that are public, some that are way private. And I pray, Father, that for each one, that these individuals will recognize that the God that they pray to is there. He does care. And he will bring a solution. It may not always be the solution that we like, but it will be the solution that brings him the most glory and eventually promotes the most good for us. We... Bring all these things before you, Father, trusting that you will do what is good and right and beneficial in each one. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to do together with you one more song this morning before we get into the message. Our message is going to be in Romans chapter 1 this morning if you want to go ahead and turn there. Um, and we'll look at several verses from that passage. But the song we're going to, uh, last song we're going to do this morning is How Great Thou Art, one of my favorites. Because uh, it just talks about how great God is. Let's sing together. Oh Lord my God, 
When I in awesome wonder Consider all the worlds thy hands have made I see the stars I hear the rolling thunder Thy power throughout the universe displayed Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee How great thou art, how great thou art Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee how great thou art, how great thou art. When through the woods and forest glades I wander, and hear the birds sing sweetly in the trees. When I look down from lofty mountain grandeur, and see the brook, and feel the gentle breeze. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. And when I think that God his Son not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in. That on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, He bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. When Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart. Then I shall bow in humble adoration and then proclaim, My God, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art. How great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art. How great thou art. Man, I may not be a great singer, which I am definitely not. But I have a great God. So do you. Turn with me this morning to Romans chapter 1. And we're going to read a, a few verses from that passage. Beginning in uh, verse 16 of that passage. It says this. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God and salvation to everyone that believeth. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. Verse 20 of Romans chapter 1. 
For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. I want to read one other verse for you. Psalm 14, verse 1. The fool has said in his heart, There is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none who does good. Let me tell you about Jim. Not his real name, by the way, but I want to tell you about Jim. My relationship with Jim began with a phone call, and I could tell immediately that he was upset. The church that I pastored at the time had a large field behind it. Brush had accumulated at the edge of that field and the stream that bordered our property. One of the men in our church, with my approval, had cleared away the undergrowth with a backhoe. Jim did not like that. His house, just five doors down from the church, was on the other side of that stream. He and his wife are conservationists. They love nature and wanted to do everything they could to help nature's creatures flourish. So when they saw someone taking away the brush, which served as a natural habitat for birds, it upset them. That undergrowth had also prevented sediment from running into the stream and polluting it. Jim expressed all of this on the phone. Frankly, I didn't understand why Jim was so upset, but I saw this as an opportunity to build a relationship with him. He agreed to let me come over and see if there was a way that we could find a workable solution. That led to me coming back a few days later with some silt fence. Jim and I installed it to help prevent the sediment from washing into the stream. And our first meeting on that day led, me, led to me learning two important facts about Jim. One, he was, an, he was an atheist. And two, he had cancer. Jim was open-minded to the possibility that he might be wrong about his atheism so he and I met several times over the next months to discuss the existence of God. Like many people, Jim's most tightly held argument against the existence of God, at least the God uh, that the Bible spoke, out, spoke of, was all the, the pain and evil that existed in the world. He questioned, how could an all-powerful, all-good, all-loving God allow so much suffering among his creation? It is a question I have faced many times. We talked. We never argued. He listened to me. I listened to him. I loaned him books and videos, which he faithfully engulfed, leading to further discussions. We talked about the universe, Jesus, and salvation. Our mutual respect also led me, led me to offer to come and pray with him in the hospital as he went in for surgery. <laughs> he, an atheist, accepted my prayer to a God he did not believe in. I guess he figured he needed all the help that he could get. I could tell that he was scared. He grasped my hand tightly as I prayed. <laughs> the next time I saw him, he remarked about how bold I was to pray in that public environment with all the dark doctors and nurses right there in the pre-op area. <laughs> he was not used to that kind of thing, even though I'd done that many times before. The one time that Tame and I went there together uh, to their house, it yielded a tour of their backyard that belonged to Jim and his wife, Ruth. It was beautiful with an enormous variety of plants, butterflies all over the place, and blueberries ready for the picking. We went home with two quart bags full of blueberries that day. I left that church, and my meetings with Jim ended. To my knowledge, Jim remained an atheist. 
Though I continue to pray for Jim's salvation, I have not seen him for years. <laughs> I think of him every time I put blueberries on my Cheerios. Jim and I are Facebook friends, so I received a notification a month ago when it was Jim's birthday. I wrote him a note via messenger rather than putting a happy birthday on his timeline, hoping that he would send me a note back and we could rekindle our conversation. I never heard anything back. My suspicion is that Jim succumbed to his cancer. I checked. He has not posted anything on Facebook for three years. Jim now knows that there is a God. We come to a day, today to a discussion of the most important question. How do we know that, that God exists? Further, if God exists, is he the God that the Bible describes? Everything in your life hinges on what you believe about God's existence and his characteristics. It is a starting point and the goal of your faith. You say, well, Chris, I believe that God exists. I spoke with him this morning. Let's move on to something else. Better yet, just go ahead and say the final prayer and we can get to dinner early. It's tempting, isn't it? But before you leave me, let me give you two reasons to keep listening. First, Scripture commands us to believe the right things, but also to know why we believe them. It says in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, Always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Peter, the one who wrote those words, sent them to people who were going through intense persecution. Their faith was being tested. The foundation of faith is weak. It will crumble under pressure. We Christians in the USA will soon face systemic persecution. Whether it comes under the Biden administration or sometime after that, it is coming. There is no denying that. Simply offering, well, that's what my Sunday school teacher taught me, or that's what I've always believed as the reason why you believe in God and the God of the Bible will not work. That may be enough for some to endure the coming attacks, but it will not be enough for most. You must know the foundation on which your beliefs are founded. Only the house built on a rock will survive when the storms come. Matthew 7, 24 and 25. Most of you listening to me are parents or grandparents. The next generation will, sooner than you want to admit it, head off to college. Did you know that most students who go to college with faith finish college without it? The survey results I looked at this week range from 59% up to 79% of students walking across the platform to receive a diploma, having jettisoned their faith by that time. Why? Among the most important reasons, no one taught them solid reasons for their faith. If you want more young people in this church, then we need to send our children strength to eventually come back to us. We must ask and answer the hard questions now because they will face them eventually. A second reason for tackling this subject is so that you will have the information you need to help someone else whose faith is teetering on the cliff or who has no faith at all. Not every sermon is for you. Some sermons are for you to use as a help for someone else. You never know when you might encounter an atheist. Estimates on how many there are range from 200 million to 750 million. That's somewhere between 3 and 10% of the world's population. Guess where most of them live? China and Russia primarily, but about 15% of Europeans fit that category as well. According to surveys conducted in 2019, the U.S. sits at 4%. Though the percentage of those in the U.S. is comparatively small, that number is growing with each passing year. It has doubled 
in the last decade. You may know someone who is an atheist. In fact, let's do something right now. If you know an atheist, and click on that sad emoji right now. In the U.S., an atheist is most likely fits these characteristics. Male, around 34 years of age, white, a college graduate, a Democrat, and he leans to the left in his ideology. Some are more aggressive in their denial of God than others, just as some Christians are more aggressive than others in their attempts to see people come to faith. No one is an atheist after they take their last breath. If nothing changes, atheists will face an eternal, horrifyingly painful consequence for their rejection of God and the rejection of His Son, Jesus Christ. You do not want that for them. But you have been scared to approach them because you did not know how to help. That is not your fault. No one taught you. I can share with you what others have taught me. We begin today, today with the classical arguments for God's existence. If you go to your ultimate source of, inf of information, Google, and type in this question, how do we know that God exists? Every article or YouTube video that comes up will include these arguments or a derivative of them. I should know. I did that Google search this week. Now, what I'm going to present to you I learned long ago, um, but I wanted to see if there was anything else out there that I could also add to this presentation this morning. I did find some other things, but they were so technical and so convoluted that I had difficulty following them. And if I can't follow it, then I certainly can't present it to you. So, I will explain to you what I know. Namely, three rational arguments for God's existence. I promise you, these arguments are simple enough for you to remember them and simple enough for you to use them. The first one is the argument from effect and cause. Let me put a scenario in front of you. You look up at the second story window of your house. You see that the window is broken. You know that windows do not get broken without something breaking them. Upon entering the house and going to the room, you see a baseball amongst the broken glass on the floor. <laughs> that baseball has your son's name on it. You remember that earlier that day, Johnny asked if he could go out and practice his hitting in the front yard. Your conclusion compels you to call out a name. Johnny! Johnny, come here! Every effect has a cause. That is why I label this argument for God's existence as effect and cause rather than the normal order of cause and effect. Most times we see the effect, what happened, long before we know what caused it. Now let's take our baseball example a little bit further. You see a once beautiful large building that has totally fallen. It is ruined. There is nothing left but a pile of rubble. As you approach it, you see a baseball nearby. Hmm. Did that baseball cause the building's destruction? No. How do you know? No baseball could cause that kind of damage. From that, we get this principle. Large effects, large happenings, need a large cause. The bigger the effect, the greater the cause must be. So consider this. The universe is as big an effect as you can find. What caused the universe to come into existence? Though we do not know the answer for that, to that for sure, at least not scientifically anyway, we know that the cause of the universe had to be bigger than the universe itself. The only thing that meets that qualification is God. Listen to these words from Psalm 19.1. The heavens declare God and the firmament, that's the skies, show his handiwork. That is the argument from cause and effect. Before we go any further and I give you the other two arguments, let me clarify something. These arguments will not prove that God exists. 
They make it logical for God to exist. No one can prove that God exists, at least not yet. But neither can anyone prove that God does not exist. Both theism, the belief that God is there, and atheism, the belief that we are alone, require faith. People can supply evidence either way. We will look at the strongest evidence against God's existence later, and it will be left to you to evaluate that evidence and come to your own conclusion. By the way, the Bible does not attempt to prove God's existence. It assumes God's existence from the very first verse. Genesis 1.1 In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. For every effect, there must be a cause. The second argument for God's existence is the argument from design. Whenever you see design, it leads to the accurate conclusion that there must have been a designer. This coming summer, many of you will go to the beach. If you go to Ocean City, Maryland, make sure that you invite Jason and Tina to lunch one day. Whatever you order for your meal, even if, even if it is sloppily arranged, that meal will give evidence of a design. The beach you will walk on manifests design as well. The lapping of the waves on the sand as the tide goes out will often leave wavy, almost parallel lines in the sand. That very simple design is not by intention because the water has no will or intelligence. The design you see there happens because they're natural processes, gravity, waves, and wind. Other examples of design, though, require an intelligence behind them. The more intricate a design and the more necessary it is that the parts work in harmony with, with each other to achieve the desired goal, the more intelligent the designer must be. Tammy and I were at Ocean City back in August, and yes, lunch. And if Jason, if he's here right now, he can confirm that by putting a note in the comments there. <laughs> While we were there, we saw some sand sculptures near the boardwalk. They were masterful, intricately designed works of art. How did they get there? Did the waves and wind through natural processes create those sculptures? <laughs> Nobody would suggest that. They could not, no matter how much time and chance you add to the equation. Only an intelligent, skilled, patient artist could do that. Though we did not know who that artist was, though she was not present, her masterpiece served as evidence that she was there. I could envision her watching from one of the buildings there on the boardwalk to see how people responded to her work. Similarly, you, your body with all its amazingly intricate systems are evidence that an intelligent designer exists. While a look in the mirror might cause you to balk at that assessment, especially when you first get up in the morning, God says that it is true. Listen to this from Psalm 139, 14. I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works and that my soul knows very well. And then listen to Ephesians 2, 10. It says, for we are his, God's workmanship. Now, I don't throw Greek at you very often, but the word there for workmanship is the word poema. Do you hear a word in there? Poem? It's the word for masterpiece. We are his masterpiece, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. <laughs> Every time that a doctor aborts a baby, another example of God's glory gets discarded as trash. I don't understand how a person who trained to save lives, who took an oath to do no harm, who holds his children tightly, and protects them from their imaginary monsters, can behave as a monster and deny life to God's beautiful creation. The only way I can see this happening is that the enemy has blinded the doctor's eye, eyes to that child's beauty. Perhaps <laughs> the enemy has blinded your eyes as well to the beauty that resides in you. 
You see yourself as ugly, either on the outside or the inside or both. While it is true that your sin repulses God, it is also true that Jesus either has or can wash you as white as beautiful snow. He says, though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Isaiah 1.18 Listen to these verses as well. Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Genesis 1.26 Then Philippians 1.6 says, Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Being made in God's image makes you beautiful. Cleansing by Jesus' blood removes the stain that hides your beauty. And the continuing work of God on you will perfect that beauty until you one day stand before Jesus as his bride, redeemed, accepted, and righteous. Since God made you in his image, you reflect God to people. That is why scripture says, whether therefore ye eat or drink or Whatever you do, in other words, in all your daily activities, do all to the glory of God. Do everything you do so that you shine God to people. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. The design that you manifest is a piece of evidence that God exists. The world around you manifests that design as well. The reason scientists proclaim the evils of climate change is because they recognize how much intricacy there is in Earth's ecosystems. Shifting Earth's temperature by just a few degrees will cause catastrophic, irreversible damage. On a larger scale, Earth's placement in the solar system is perfectly positioned to support life. Looking through a microscope or a telescope yields the same conclusion. Our universe shows evidence of a grand design. While some scientists are, are not yet willing to admit the existence of God, they can no longer deny the intricate design present in the universe and its creatures. Many accept the presence of an intelligent designer, even if they are not willing to identify the designer as God. They have taken a step in the right direction, but many still have far to go before they will submit to the evidence. Pray for them to look up from the petri dish or look beyond the planets, fall on their knees, and see God. Argument number one, for every effect there must be a cause, and the cause must be greater than the effect. Argument number two, when there is design, there must be a designer. The more intricate the design, the more necessary it is for the designer to be intelligent. The third argument for the existence of God is the presence of an almost universally accepted system of laws, a moral code that exists in virtually every culture, regardless of whether that culture has had access to the recorded divine revelation. Murder lying, stealing, disrespect for, for parents. Most cultures frown on these actions. From where did this universal idea of right and wrong come? Perhaps this universal law came from a universal lawgiver, otherwise known as God. You might be tempted to suggest that the reason people see these actions as wrong is because people figured out through experience that these actions are obviously hurtful to a functioning society. Before you take that route, though, consider the pathway that evolutionists say that we followed in order to be able to get here, namely, survival of the fittest. Ask yourself this question. How do those focused only on survival make moral decisions? They do whatever it takes to survive. As one author says, quote, Moral principles are drastically disconnected from the ruthless, selfish reasoning that one would expect of a creature randomly evolved to survive at any cost. Close quote. 
and yet we find more guidelines that are common throughout all cultures. For example, the Bible and the Code of Hammurabi share some ethical and moral teachings. Because Hammurabi recorded his moral code centuries before Moses wrote Genesis, people accused the Bible of plagiarizing this human king. Another, the moral teachings of Jesus and those of Buddha share some characteristics. Buddha lived four to five centuries before Jesus. Though I could not verify it, my information is that Buddha said this, do not do to others what you do not want them to do to you. Does that sound familiar? Jesus said, do to others what you want them to do to you. The two statements are a little different, and though that difference is significant, both Jesus and the Buddha taught what we know as the golden rule. So here, who was the source of those teachings? Did Jesus tweak Buddha? Or was the eternal Son of God the one who placed the thought in the Buddha's heart? Well, considering that, quote, the golden rule can be found in some almost every ethical tradition, close quote. The only logical conclusion is that we all drew it from the same ancient source, the lawgiver. Even the Ten Commandments, at least four of the Ten Commandments, merely codified the laws that humans already recognized, murder, adultery, theft, and lying. I would suggest to you that if you go back and read the Ten Commandments, most of them have a great deal of explanation that comes along with them, but not those four. Why? I can envision when Moses read them off, I can hear the people saying, well, duh, everybody knows that. The presence of similar moral laws across multiple cultures over millennia of time should not lead us to think that they borrowed from each other or that each culture came up with these laws on their own. You know, great th minds think alike. Rather, as we go back generation after generation to our common ancestry in the garden, common laws should lead us to a common lawgiver. Likewise, the multiple stories of a universal flood and the writings of other civilizations show support for the biblical account rather than casting doubt on it. If there was a universal flood, you would expect that other cultures would include information in their historical records about it. You shouldn't be surprised or dismayed about that. You should expect it. When we talk about laws that were common among people, we're talking about cultures, civilizations, and societies, not individuals. And we are also speaking of the beginning of this culture and what it holds up as its ideals not what it does in practice. Every culture degenerates over time. Just look at the morals of the pilgrims who first came to this land versus the morals of those who live here now. And just because a society has those laws does not mean that its citizens have those laws. Does scripture support this idea of a universal law among all cultures given by a divine lawgiver? Yes, it does. Listen to these words. When Gentiles who do not have the law, by nature do the things in the law, these, although not having the law, are a law to themselves, who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and between themselves their thoughts accusing or else excusing them. Romans 2, verses 4 and 5. Solomon said in Ecclesiastes 3.11 that God has, quote, put eternity in their hearts, close quote. A universal law strongly suggests a universal lawgiver. Argument number one, for every effect, there must be a cause and the cause must be greater than the effect. Argument number two, where there is design, there must be a designer. The more intricate the design, the more necessary it is for the designer to be intelligent. Argument number three, a universal law strongly suggests a universal lawgiver. One more argument I want to put before you. We're not going to spend a lot of time here, but another argument for the existence of God is the fulfillment of biblical prophecy. 
someone had to see the future and communicate it to the prophets for them to record it. Though some of those prophecies are vague, many are specific detailed predictions about people and places. There are hundreds of them. And since those prophecies validate the accuracy of the Bible, they also validate the Bible's description of God. Not only is God there, but he is the God of the Bible. Now, those are some logical, rational arguments for the existence of a God. Not all of them argue necessarily for the God that the Bible presents. The value in them is that they can get a person to consider the possibility that they might be mistaken about their belief that there is no God. Those arguments to lead, can lead a person to accept, accept the is existence of God so long as that person makes his decisions based on legitimate, rational, logical reasoning. But, just as the number of atheists is increasing, so the number of people who rely on rational thinking is diminishing. If you don't believe me, just check out the media whether it be social media, network media, or some other source of information. Most advertisements now base their appeal on emotions rather than information. Insurance ads no longer tell you why you should trust that company in a crisis. They use weird creatures and funny situations to make you feel good about the company. So, let's approach this subject from a different angle. Businesses make use of a profit or loss projection when they make decisions. They ask, will I gain more than I'll lose if I make this acquisition, merge with another company, or hire this individual? We can ask that same question in regard to God's existence. Here we go. What do you lose if there is no God and there never has been a God? Well, you lose guilt. After all, there's no objective right or wrong without God. So if you say that you do not believe in God, then why do you still feel guilty? Guilt in itself would be an evidence of some internal standard of law that you have broken a standard put there by God. You also lose the possibility of an afterlife without God. You might be okay with that. Frankly, I am too. If I am wrong, and there is no God, and no afterlife, and I cease to exist when I die, I can handle that. Not everyone can. Many have an overdeveloped sense of justice, a desire to see people get what they deserve. The afterlife that the Bible describes is a place where everyone faces the eternal consequences of of their earthly choices. We know that people make bad choices. Those choices create pain for the individual, and they also create pain for those that are connected to that individual or that are impacted by that individual. How does it make you feel when another person's actions cause you pain, but they do not care and they never face retribution? Are you satisfied with the injustice that happens in our world? The plan that God has laid out faces that injustice head on and answers it. Most people will get exactly what they deserve in God's system. As Billy Sunday, an old preacher from the past, used to say, payday someday. The only ones who will not have to pay for their sins are those who have received forgiveness from Jesus Christ. Now don't, now, don't worry. That forgiveness is not like a presidential pardon where guilty people get to walk free without a penalty being paid. No. The only reason they get released from their penalty is because Jesus paid it for them. He was their substitute. Every penalty gets paid in God's version of of the afterlife. Some get their penalty paid by Jesus. The rest are paid by the people who committed the crime. God is a God who believes in justice. 
Thirdly, without God, you lose the answer for your pain. The most often repeated argument against the existence of God, at least the God that the Bible describes him as, is all the pain in the world. I'm going to deal with the issue of pain, but I'm afraid I don't have time to deal with that this morning. I'm going to save that for our weeknight Bible studies. Prior to that, I will post an article on Facebook that deals with the issue of pain from a very personal basis. The presence of pain was the primary sticking point for my friend, Jim. Everywhere he looked, he saw pain that he could not explain. Those who deserve it and those who do not deserve it. Fine. You know that there is evil in the world. Would that evil still be in the world if everyone suddenly stopped believing in God? You know that it would. John Lennon wrote a song about a world where everyone believes only in the existence of the natural world, those things that can be experienced through our senses. He imagined that world would be perfect, a utopia. Would it? God did not bring pain into the world, but he will cause its eradication. He is the only one who can. Listen to this beautiful, hope-filled promise from Revelation 21, verses 3 through 5. It says this, And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. God is far more emotional about the evil in the world than you are. It infuriates him, but it does not frustrate him. He allowed the greatest injustice ever, the extremely painful crucifixion of his righteous son, so that evil could be dealt with while still providing a means for mercy to be applied. Evil will find no place in God's eternal throne. The irony is that the people who disbelieve in God because he think he do, they think he does not deal with evil have no objective standard of evil because they do not believe in God. That gets us to the fourth loss you will experience without God. You lose the right to judge anything as evil. You lose the right to judge at all. Without God as an objective standard, the only basis you have at that point for judgment is whether it pleases you. I have news for you. If what pleases you is the standard of right and wrong, then you must then give that same right to the other guy. What pleases him may bring pain to you. So how do you feel about your losses? How do you feel about the things you lose if there is no God? Let's quickly look at the other side. What do you gain if there is a God, if he's the God described in the Bible, and if you are willing to submit to him? Wow, what a question. You gain purpose. You gain peace, peace for today and peace for eternity. You know that there is someone calling the shots and that he is good, powerful, wise, and loving. You may not always agree with what he does and what he brings into your life, but you can trust that he knows what he's doing and that what he is doing is for your, God, for your good. With God... I gain the confidence that my story and the story of the people that I love will end well. 
again, an all-powerful, all-loving, all-wise Father with whom I can have a deep and meaningful relationship. We sang the song a little while ago, He knows my name. My tears fall, but He sees my tears. And He calls my name to comfort me. The amazing thing is that the God who rules the universe wants a relationship with me. He wants a relationship with you too. Do you remember that old saying that the neighborhood kids would say whenever they were trying to one-up each other in the neighborhood? My dad's bigger than your dad. My dad's not just bigger. He is also far more loving, kind, gracious, merciful, wise, and good. John 10.10 10 says, The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come, God has come, that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. With God as my Father, I also gain friends, a community of believers known as the church. Oops, maybe I should not have mentioned that one. You say, you almost had me until you mentioned that. You see, I don't consider Christians to be a gain. I count that a loss. Understood. Christians can be a pretty messed up group sometimes. Living in a community of believers may very well be the reason that you stopped believing in God. But you have not seen what we can be or what we will one day become. I am sorry. I ask your forgiveness if your experience with Christians or a church environment has been a bad one. It happens, but it does not need to. And remember, not everyone who claims to be a Christian is one. Not everyone who goes to church is a Christian. The reason most of the people listening to me right now are excited is because we will soon be meeting in person again. That excitement is not because they're tired of, tired of seeing my oversized face on their computer screen or that they no longer want to hear me sing a cappella music. Neither is it because we are beautiful, perfect people. We get on each other's nerves. Long, differing opinions. We get miffed at each other. Our church is full of strong-willed people. I have only been the pastor of this church a little over a year. Many of the people in the church that I pastor have been there for decades. They have faced some horrific situations, from their death of their former beloved pastor to the muddied reputation of another. Add to that list a pandemic that has twice caused us to close our doors for more than t uh, 10 weeks at a time just in the past year? <laughs> the crises this church has faced led some to question its survival. But we're here, <laughs> together spiritually right now and together physically soon. Why? Why have we survived? Two reasons. We love God and we love each other. The people at my church are not just my customers who have bought into what I am selling. They are my friends. We are a relatively small church, but it does not take a large church to have large problems. If you put people in a group of more than one, you're going to have personality clashes, disagreements, hurt feelings, and more. It doesn't even always take more than one to have those things happen. But the people in this church would serve each other, defend each other, tell each other the truth when the truth is uncomfortable, pray for each other, and in some cases, die for each other. Can you say that about the people you hang out with? Purpose, peace, hope, a relationship with loving people and a relationship with the most powerful entity in the universe. Those are just a few of the things you gain by taking God into your life. You may say, I don't need God for me to have the things you listed. I find my purpose, my peace, and my friends 
elsewhere. Then let me ask you this question. What happens when the thing you say gives you this, these blessings is gone? If you are basing your life on anything that you can lose, you are on shaky ground. You need something eternal. You need God. Most of you listening to me right now are Christians. <laughs> You've been tapping that thumbs up emoji and that heart emoji repeatedly throughout the message. You have believed in God your whole life and you have reaped many of the benefits that come with that belief. So I hope that you have not tuned me out by now thinking that you as a firm believer do not need to be convinced that God exists. Remember, as I said earlier, some of the information you gain is for someone else. You might encounter someone this week whose faith is struggling and you can use this message and some of the things I've told you in order to be able to help them. Or at least you can ask them to go back and view the message on our Facebook page. You no longer have to say, wow, I wish so-and-so had been there. This message was perfect for them. No, you can share this message. You can do it right now. So that, so that they can view the recorded view, uh, version of this later on our Facebook page. We can also provide it for you on DVD, free of charge, if you simply ask for it so that you can give it to another person. However, before you dismiss the content of this message as only applying to the other guy, let me give you another cautionary story. Let me tell you about Julia. Again, not her real name. Julia was an active member of the church that I pastored in West Virginia. She had recently discussed with me her desire to start working closely with the youth of our church. She was excited. I was excited. And then she got a phone call that rocked her world. Her dad had cancer. Julia blamed God. She and her family stopped coming to church. I went to her home loaned her a book to read that talks about the confusing things that God does sometimes and prayed for her. My attempts to get her and her family to return to church proved fruitless. She questioned how the God she thought she knew could allow cancer to happen to someone she loved. Somewhere along the way, she had apparently gotten the idea that serving God shielded a person from pain. I certainly had not taught her that, but someone else had. Would she call herself an atheist? I do not think so. Would she still call herself a Christian? That's likely. But she was reassessing her portrait of who she considered God to be. I left that church several years later, having failed to persuade her and her family to come back to church or to believe, as she once did, that God was still good even though he allowed cancer to exist. Julia's dad successfully defeated that bout of cancer. I do not know, though, if her faith survived the badger waiting inside her. Like all people will, Julia's dad eventually died, but it did not happen for over a decade. I saw the Facebook post. Julia looks forward to seeing her dad again. I am not sure that she will get her wish. Before you go saying, well, <laughs> that can never happen to me, listen to this verse. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands... Take heed, lest he fall. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 12. Either by a person or by a painful circumstance, your current belief about God will be likely challenged somewhere along the way. Maybe it already has been. The only way that your faith will survive is if you get an accurate picture of who God is. The place you find that picture is is in the Bible. See, this God who exists also cares about what happens in your life. Therefore, he has not remained silent. 
He has spoken. Further, he has come. There is only one God, the one that the Bible describes, and only one way to get to him is through the Bible offers through God's Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus, who is God, was born as a human, lived a sinless life, died to pay the debt that you owe because of your sin, resurrected from the grave, and is coming again. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. John 14 is 6. Okay, let's say that I brought you far enough to admit the possibility that there is a God. That is still far short of convincing you that the God out there is the God that the Bible presents. Granted. So here's what I want you to do. Read the Bible for yourself. As you do, ask God to reveal himself to you. You say, the Bible is a big book. Yes, it is. But the God you choose to rule your life and relate to is a big decision. The biggest decision you will ever make. And if your eternity rests on who God is and how you respond to him, then no cost is too too high to pay to get this decision right. Reading the Bible will likely prompt some questions. I am not the answer guy, but I know the one who is. I make myself available to you to help you find the answers you are looking for. You can find my contact information on our Facebook page or at our website. If necessary, after you read the Bible, compare the God and its pages to what the Quran says about Allah or what the Bhagavad Gita says about the thousands of gods that Hindus worship. I think, though, that by the time you have finished the Bible, you will have fallen in love with the God who wrote its pages for you and to you. Leaving the research and the decision up to you may sound dangerous, but it's exactly what God tells you to do through his word. God says, Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. I will be found by you, says the Lord, and I will bring you back from your captivity. Jeremiah 29, 12-14 This is a decision that no one can make for you, but it is a decision that you must make. One of Israel's past leaders, Joshua, put that decision to the Jewish people. To them he said, If it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served that were on this other side of the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua twenty four fifteen. There are many options for who you will worship, but there is only one God who is worthy of your worship. Let's pray together. Father, I pray this morning for those listening now or in the future that have you as their Savior and those that do not. For those that do have Jesus as their Savior, I pray that you will confirm their beliefs that are correct in their hearts and that you will correct those things in their hearts that are not correct. They may believe that you exist, but have a, have a wrong opinion of who you are or how you do things. So I pray that you will use their, your word to correct those falsities. But I pray especially, Father, for those that don't have Jesus as their Savior. I pray that you will take them step by step in the direction of Jesus so that one day they have their faith confirmed as they stand before the throne of God and they willingly fall on their face to proclaim the wonderful name of Jesus. 
And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, thank you so much for being with us this morning. It's not too late to share this post with other people. Maybe you know somebody that's struggling with their faith. Or maybe, it doesn't even matter. If you'll share this, it somebody that is struggling with their faith. Please share this. Not so they can see this ugly mug, but so that they can see God. Our weeknight Bible studies this week, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday at 5 o'clock, will take this discussion further. And it's important for you to be there because there's so many important things I just didn't have time to get to this morning. Be with us Tuesday, Wednesday night, right here on Facebook, 5 o'clock, as we continue in this topic. Now let me tell you what's Next week we're dealing with this question. What does the Bible say about speaking in tongues? Ha! Huh. I don't deal with simple subjects. Should be a fun day. Hope you guys have a great rest of your day. We will see you soon.